Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Today we're going to begin a series in the life of Joseph. And as we do, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever used the expression before, nobody asked me? Have you ever used the expression before? And we get a little bit bothered because we feel like, well, someone should have thought to have asked me. And it could be over a a myriad of different things, but sometimes we're a little frustrated and we express that frustration by saying, well, seriously, Nobody asked me. And you know, when you start to think about the life of Joseph, certainly Joseph could have said, Lord, I've got this and this and this, and then you put this on my plate. Lord, I wish you would have asked me, have you ever felt like that with God? The title of the message today as we begin this study in the life of Joseph is Born into Brokenness. And that certainly is an apt Expression for the life of Joseph. He was born into a life of brokenness. Nobody asked him. Nobody asks us either. They don't ask us the question regarding what kind of a family or parents or circumstances. Or for that matter, nobody asks us what kind of body or intellect or musical or academic or athletic talents we might prefer to have. Nobody asked about our likings or our leanings. None of these do we select prior to our birth. And while we may like to change what we've been given, we are simply tasked with confronting what we have been given. What we face in life is often far beyond your control. But how you face what you have been given in life is not beyond your control. And that really encompasses the life of Joseph. Far beyond his control were the circumstances that were dealt to him, but not beyond his ability to say, God, walking with you, with an understanding that while people may intend things, for my demise, you are a God that is bigger than their evil intentions And God, I can see that even in another person's evil, you can use it for good. As we look at the life of Joseph, we're going to see a theme running all throughout his life. It's one that stands out for us above all else. It is that God orchestrates the circumstances, the people, the events of Joseph's life in order to accomplish his intended purposes. Circumstantially, Joseph's life was a mess, but providentially, Joseph's life was absolutely perfect. God was weaving together the God-less choices of those around Joseph to accomplish the God-ordained purposes he had for Joseph. And I would submit he is doing exactly the same thing for you. There might be those here involved in this service today that would say, circumstantially, my life is a mess. It's not that you chose them. You wouldn't have. In fact, you may even be working to avoid them. Circumstantially, it's just a mess. But providentially, there is someone that is working behind the scenes And he's doing so for your good and ultimately for his glory. So as we look at the life of Joseph, we'll see that God so very clearly was actually preparing a picture. He is pointing us to another who is yet to come, who is far more than Joseph, whose name is Jesus. 
Now, all throughout Scripture, we see pictures in the Word, and that's what they're there for. It doesn't matter the person you're studying. It doesn't matter the event, the, the circumstance, the occasion. We just keep seeing all of these woven pictures of Jesus throughout the pages of Scripture. And you say, well, well, why is that? And how could that be? Well, let's ask this question. Who's the author ultimately of Scripture? Well, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit spake that the Holy Spirit is the one who moved. The Holy Spirit gave the very words. And what's the primary job of the Holy Spirit? Well, the book of John tells us that the Holy Spirit is to magnify Jesus Christ. Jesus said it very plainly. He said, there's one that's coming, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And then Jesus said, he shall glorify me. In other words, he's going to keep magnifying Jesus. Doesn't it make sense? that the author of Scripture would use page after page, line after line, word after word to simply weave through all of those characters, all of those stories, all of those events, the person of Jesus Christ. And you know, one of the, the, the ways he does that is through the life of Joseph. Joseph becomes for us one of those very early but very clear pictures of the Savior. Now, there's something also interesting about Joseph that may be unique to him of, the, of all the other characters of Scripture apart from Christ. We don't see anything that Joseph did wrong. He's kind of like that perfect guy. Do you know people like that? It's like, oh, they never do anything wrong, you know. The only thing that they say about them is just all good stuff. Well, you know, Joseph is the guy that you just never see anything wrong about him. But we do know that Joseph's not a perfect man right? He's not a perfect man. And by the way, he's going to face the same struggles, the same issues, the same challenges. How he faces them, he does face them with, with a lot of dignity, with a lot of respect, with a lot of character, but he does face the same things. Is he perfect? No. It's just God in his wisdom chose to not reveal all of his imperfections. Even as I submit you, you may know him more than the next person, but God hasn't revealed all of yours either. So God chose to keep someone, in a sense, intact or removed from the distraction of his sin to allow us to more clearly see the one he represents, and that is his Savior. And by the way, just some early pictures. We'll see this woven all the way through, but some early pictures of Christ that we see already well, first of all, his occupation. In Genesis 37, verse number 2, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock. Well, there may be no more, more beautiful or endearing picture of Jesus than him as the good shepherd. Jesus even says, I am the good shepherd that giveth his life for his sheep. There's nothing more beautifully pictured to us during times of distress or sorrow or loss than the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, his occupation, the shepherd, and, and then his hatred of evil. Again in verse number two, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, I think many have sadly misrepresented or maligned Joseph for bringing this evil report. In fact, some of the, the commentaries that I read in preparation for this message, they said that, well, Joseph, you know, he, he brought this evil report, and, and should he have really, he was probably somewhat of a tattletale. I, I would reject that notion entirely. I think that Joseph is here again a clear picture of Jesus Christ. The Bible says Christ speaking in John chapter 7 verse 7, the world cannot hate you but me it hateth because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Joseph has throughout his life this, this idea of I detest evil. What a clear picture of Jesus. We see the picture of Christ in his father's love. Genesis 37, verse number 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. All throughout this story, we see a very deep and a special love that Jacob has for his son Joseph. Now, again, some may say he shouldn't have had favoritism. He shouldn't have singled Joseph out. But before we arrive at that conclusion, back up for just a moment. 
I, I hope you're thinking today and, and put yourself in Jacob's shoes. I personally believe that Jacob had hopes for Joseph that would actually impact his other children. He had high hopes for his children. Every time a child is born, oh, Lord, may they walk with you. So many of those children, I believe, were raised with, with in a sense, the old Jacob. So many of those children were raised when, when Jacob lived primarily for himself. But there was one who saw the new Jacob, this prince with God, this Israel, and all the impact that that life had as well on his children. Yes, he, he does have a special love. We see that he, he gives him this coat of many colors. He has inconsolable grief when he thought that Joseph had been slain by wild beasts. He was willing to make a long journey to Egypt to see his son before he succumbed to death. All of this points to the love of a father for his son. When Jesus was about to begin his public ministry, his earthly ministry, the heavens open and you hear the father's love for the son when he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How do we know that, that there are some pictures, even the coat that Joseph wore, it bears a mark to, this is one that is set aside. This is one that is marked. This is one that will do those things that God has appointed him to do, even as Jesus came to do fully the Father's will. Well, what was Joseph? He was a guy that was born into brokenness. We're going to look at three groups of people that kind of influence his life and, and that he's going to interact with. The first one that we'll talk about are his seniors, and, and that is his parents in particular. His seniors, they're certainly not your first choice. These are the generations of Jacob, and then it says Joseph. So his father, Jacob, anything but a perfect father. Clearly, he had some challenges that did run deep into his character. But Jacob did know God. He met God at Bethel, the house of God. For years he lived, I think, a carnal life, a life lived in the flesh. However, the Bible records that not too long after Joseph was born, God stirred up the heart of Jacob to return to his homeland, the land of God's promise. The Bible says in Genesis 30, verse number 25, And it came to pass, when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away, that I may go into mine own place, to my own country, this is the time when he's going to again meet with God. And God is going to change his life. Clearly, God's about to do a great work in the life of Jacob. Joseph, he's going to grow up under this, in a sense, this new dad, this prince with God. I also believe that Jacob favors Joseph for a few reasons that we have alluded to previously. He's a favored son because he was the child of a favored wife, Rachel. It became very special to Jacob, but I do believe there is something more. I believe that Jacob may have been longing for a son that would become the hope of all his sons and daughters. Now let me say that again and think about what Jacob may be thinking. Jacob has had this experience with God that impacted him. Joseph is not so much younger than all his brothers. I know he's the son of his old age, but, but he's not this, um, he's not way removed. It's not like Reuben is 20 years older. Most believe that because of the time period when these children were born, there is a very tight window when these children were born. And, and child after child, Jacob now says, oh, Lord, please. And now I believe he is longing for Maybe Joseph. And he starts to see something in him. He sees this sensitivity to the things of God. Lord, maybe you'd use Joseph to reach my children for you. Remember, the brothers will despise Joseph. Yet the one that they will despise will actually become the means of their salvation. Their rescue. And by the way, more than just their physical rescue, I believe that it was through Joseph, through his confrontation with them, I believe these brothers were truly changed. The one that they sold as a slave would become the exalted one. How similar this is to the son of another father. 
the, re- the hopes of a rebellious family hung on the shoulders of Joseph. Joseph did become that favored son. Jacob had rebellious sons. One by one, Joseph's older brothers had broken the heart of their father. And by the way, let me pause and say this here. There are many parents here today, there may be many that have joined us, that know the pain of a broken heart. You have a child that has made choices that have hurt you more deeply than you knew you could hurt. At times, we wonder, God, what have I done that brought this about? The first response is, what did I do wrong? Please remember this. Remember, first of all, that there are no perfect parents. Let me say that again. There are no perfect parents. When children of parents grow to walk with the Lord, the parent oftentimes think that I at least am more perfect than the next parent. We oftentimes think that it is because of my parenting that my children are walking with the Lord. Let me ask you this. How many of you know, don't raise your hand, but how many of you know of godly children with godless parents? Do you know of some? So is it because of their godlessness that they have godly children? We would say it's because of the what? The grace of God. So if you're a parent who acknowledges that I am not a perfect parent, then acknowledge also the grace of God connected to any child that walks with him. Does parenting matter? Absolutely. Do we want to be godly parents? Most definitely. But do we want to guard ourselves from being presumptuous parents? And the answer again is a hearty amen. There are children who are, have godly parents and And uh, and I do believe that there is one who's an example in Scripture that understands when a child walks away. There is no one that is a better father than God. And God, who gave his first children the perfect environment, daily time and instruction with him, and everything necessary for their ultimate good, had his first children rebel, not because of his lack of perfection, but because of their own willful choice. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 1 is a typical verse and not an exclusive one. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel but not of me, and that cover with a covering but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Did Jacob favor Joseph? Absolutely. Why? Because he was hanging his hopes for his family on this godly, very special young man. Clearly, not unlike another father who hung hopes on his own son that many would be brought to righteousness. Well, that's a a snapshot at the life of Jacob. What about his mother, Rachel? Well, she was favored in a home that had many wives. Her own sister, Leah, was first given to Jacob, but he tolerated her only because she provided him with children. Rachel, in an attempt to provide additional children to her husband, to become again a favored bride, gave her own handmaid to Jacob, Bilhah. Leah later does the same thing with her handmaid, Zilpah. We see it in Genesis 35, verses 23 through 26, that that these are the generations, and it lists the children. And it also mentions these two handmaids that were given to him. Rachel began that. Rachel's the one who stole the little image from her father, from Joseph's grandfather. The, 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 little, the little image that would be set up. And In fact, if Joseph as just a child would have said, Grandpa Laban, who is your God? It would have been entirely possible for Laban to have taken him over and pointed to a little image and said, there is my God. Just a little image, a little statue. Well, this is the kind of family, this is the kind of mother that Rachel was. Was she caring? Did she love her children? Clearly she did. Did she love God? I believe so. Was she perfect? Far from it. If you want to use the the expression, a dysfunctional family, clearly this is the family of Joseph. Well, we see his seniors. What about his siblings? To begin, understand that Joseph had ten brothers that hated him. 
Joseph was the son of the favored wife. It was no secret to anyone. It did cause envy and jealousy in the home. One of the things that we we often recognize is that our children sense a great stability in the home when there is an understanding of love between dad and mom. You know, one of the greatest environments that you can provide for your kids is not a focus that is so heavy on your children, but a focus that is heavy on your spouse. When you know, growing up in a home, that dad loves mom and that mom loves dad, there is something wonderfully protective healthy for those children growing up in the home. And Joseph lived in a home where where dad had four wives and one was more special than the other and and all of the challenges that swirled around that. You say, well, well, you know, we just want to, we only have these kids for a short amount of time. That's true. And make sure that the time before they're there, the time they're there, and and the time after they're gone, that there is something that becomes the primary relationship. And that's not actually the parent-child relationship. It's the, the parent-parent, the spouse relationship. Hey, listen, man, let your kids know that, that dad loves mom, you know. I can still picture in my house as a kid growing up, dad coming in from, we'd be outside playing basketball or doing something, and dad, you know, chasing mom around the house. Like, hey, come here. And he's all sweating. He's like, oh, Jerry, get away from me, you know. And she's running away. Come here, Jordan. I'm not touching you, you know. And, and dad grabbing mom and sneaking up behind her and giving her a peck on the neck. And, and all of us kids would be like, oh, oh. We're never going to admit, oh, that's so nice. We're not going to do that. But let me tell you what we're also doing. We, we might be saying, cut it out. Oh, oh. Wait, we might be saying that outside. But let me tell you, inside there's something happening that says it is good that dad loves mom. There's something happening that's just stabilizing that says mom loves dad. Don't don't play good guy, bad guy with your kids. Don't say to your children, well, let's do this because you know how dad is. See, you just sided with your child. Don't go to your child and say, hey, come on, guys. We got to, you know, you know, mom, she wants us to do this. We got to. Don't do that. No, no, no. Hey, we are going to. No, dad and I said, what does that do? It provides protection in the home. Well, what do we have with his siblings? Wow, we're, we're, we don't have time to look through all of them, but think about the, first, the eldest. This is the one that is to have the blessing of his father. Reuben, the firstborn, born to Leah. Because of the competition between Jacob's wives to provide him children, They were born in very close age, and and Reuben's birth now, the firstborn, it's filled with promise. Clearly, in Jacob's day, he wanted and needed sons. He needed them to extend the family name. He needed them to carry on the family business. And this firstborn son was to be his pride and joy. Remember, in a patriarchal family, he had the right to be the family priest, this firstborn to receive the double portion of the blessing, the material inheritance. He actually is the one, like he has the right now to be in the line of Messiah. Just as his uncle Esau had thrown these things away, Reuben would as well. Remember, all sin is condemned in Scripture. However, there are sins that carry specific consequence. It it can be forgiven. It just doesn't null and void the consequence of the sin. God most certainly forgives the sin of adultery. But it does not wipe away the consequence. Reuben committed not only an act of immorality, but it was was an understood act of, of such bold defiance. He he went into his father's bed. You know, I suppose he was hoping that it would be forgotten. I I suppose that he thought that this will will blow over. I can do what I want. He was a a willful, prideful, do-what-you-want kind of a man. Remember, again, it's all condemned in Scripture, but there are some consequences that you don't get to roll back. A classic example of that is David with Bathsheba. 
Was David forgiven of his sin of adultery? And the answer is wonderfully, mercifully, graciously, yes. But did that, did that remove the consequence? The child died. And, and then there was something that was, that was repeated. There was something of, of David's family now that took on something that David couldn't roll back. Do you remember when Absalom stole the hearts of the kingdom and, and now Absalom, David's own son, is trying to undermine him. He's, his own son is trying to destroy the father. He couldn't see the love that David had for him. All he had was envy and hatred for his dad. But now David has to flee for his life. And Do you remember what the Bible says about David and Bathsheba? That he was up on the rooftop in the, in the cool of the evening. And that's where he first spied Bathsheba. You remember what else took place on a rooftop? Absalom sets up a tent on that rooftop. And there, in in front of all Israel, David does this secretly, quietly. In fact, he tries to cover over his sin. But not Absalom. Absalom, in the sight of all Israel, sends David's wives, those, those that he had left for the care, the keeping of the house, he sends them into the tent. And then Absalom... in in broad daylight, goes into the tent. And there's no question about what Absalom's doing in the tent. He is publicly defying his father. You see, David, if he could roll that back, oh, he would roll it back. There are some things that, that we are now experiencing, and we wish we could roll back. There are some here today that say, I failed in that area and I wish I could roll it back. You know what you can have? You can have wonderful forgiveness and that David had. There's still some sweet psalms that he will write. There's still wonderful fellowship. He couldn't roll something back and he knew it. But there's also a group of people here today that have not yet committed. The sin that you wish you could roll back. It's specifically to you that I'm speaking right now. You have an opportunity that some do not have. Some have forfeited that. They would sit down and if they could and honestly tell you, hey, hey, don't make the same mistake that I've made. Don't do what I have done. There are some things that I am forgiven and I am so thankful for a gracious God. But if I had it to do over again, And I can't help but think that Reuben, when the time of the blessing was to come, and now the children are all gathered around, and and he's even hopeful when he first hears his father speak. It's interesting that the Bible says in Genesis 49, beginning in verse number 2, when when Jacob, Israel, now has the children gathered around, maybe Reuben's thinking, I got away with it. Because he now says, Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben. He stands and he listens. Thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Yeah, I got away with it. Okay, dad, keep speaking because I am the eldest. I am the one that receives the inheritance, the double portion of blessing. I do stand in the position of priest for the family. Oh, there's something about my future that will be noted. But his father goes on, and his father now reads, verse number four, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed then defilest thou it. And then as if he's speaking to everyone else in the room, not just to Reuben, he says, he went up to my couch. You could feel the tension in the room because Reuben, the eldest, that that did have responsibility, that Jacob did have hopes for, he could still be forgiven. But the consequence now, 
will clearly remain. After this hopeful beginning, we see the hidden past that comes to light. This is Jacob's oldest son, Joseph's oldest brother. Just to even mention in brief his other brothers, Dan, he's referred to as a serpent. Naphtali, he's called a wild deer let loose that can't be controlled. Simeon and Levi, Simeon and Levi were simply cruel. Their sister, Dinah, had gone out and and she had, out of her curiosity, met someone. She was lured into, taken into a relationship. And, And so the brothers, through a deceitful plan, went and mercilessly slew all the men of the, the Ishmaelites that had, had been by. They, they go in now and they just do this utter work of destruction. This is what Jacob says about them. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land. He said, listen, my children, here's what you've done to my name. When my name is mentioned now, your actions have caused my name to stink in the land. These are Joseph's brothers. Judah, he's the one who worked out the deal to sell Joseph into slavery. Later, Judah, because he hadn't been honest with his own daughter-in-law, Judah is taken and actually fathers a child by his own daughter-in-law. These are just a few of the troubled siblings of Joseph. He is troubled by his seniors, and he is troubled by his siblings. We're just going to wrap it up by looking at his situation. His situation, circumstances are those that are noted in the life of Joseph. Circumstances are God's means of conforming us, and Satan's means of of destroying us. It all depends on how you are willing to have them used. How easily Joseph could have blamed his parents, his siblings, his situation. Instead, he chose to see the hand of God actively at work on his behalf. Who is using your life today? Who is using the circumstances of your life today? Is it God, your Savior, or Satan, the supplanter, the one who wants to trip you up. Trusting God with our circumstances, do you know what it means? It means that we're simply saying, God, I'm not the exception. Exception thinking is saying, I know God is in control, but, okay, do you know that God is in control? Is he in control? Then is he in control of your life? Don't say, yeah, he's in control, but... What about, no, 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 is he in control, yes or no? Start there. We say God is in control, but why did he allow my parents to divorce? God is in control, but why did he allow this to happen in my childhood? God is in control, but why did I unjustly lose my job? God is in control, but why did my spouse destroy our family? God was in control, but why was I born with this? God was in control, but why did my girlfriend, my boyfriend break up with me? God is in control, but why did I never marry? God is in control, but why did my child go astray? God is in control, but why do I have cancer? And you can fill in the blanks. God is in control, but... No, 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 no. There's there's nothing after God is in control. Period. God is in control. Period. And you know, that's what what Joseph does. Joseph just comes to the place where he says, God, circumstantially, my life is a mess. When he's old enough to just think about, maybe he grew up thinking, this is kind of normal family, until he started to to look at other families. And like, wow, I have a mess of a family. I I was born into brokenness. But he's trusting God with his situation. He's saying God, when I trust you with my circumstances, I place you and not me on the throne. Instead of continually asking, what in the world is happening to me? Joseph understood an essential truth that God, not Joseph, was in control. Remember, the circumstances of Joseph's life were a mess. He was born into brokenness. But by the providence of God, 
his circumstances were just what God was going to use. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.